Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for those that have already signed on. Uh, we're just going to give a few more moments to uh, hopefully get everyone who wants to participate uh, linked in, and uh, then we'll be up and running. Thank you for your patience. While we're uh, waiting, uh, as everyone signs in, feel free to go to the chat room and uh, let us know where you're listening from. Great, looks like we have quite the international audience with folks all the way down in Argentina listening in and from other countries. Uh, as uh, we get started here, uh, please let us know in the chat room where you are listening from. And for our panelists, a lot of those people who are saying hi to us are past participants in our international short courses. It's good to see all of you online. All right, folks, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jim Barbarak, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University. And uh, I'm here uh, in the background uh, is Aaron Hicks, uh, who's our program manager in our center, and my fellow co-director, Ryan Fincham. Uh, Ryan will be uh, managing the uh, question and answer session, and Aaron will be managing uh, uh, logistics today. Uh, let me first provide you all with an overview of this webinar series, and then we will quickly get into the topic of today, how to broaden access to parks and protected areas. The Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and the U.S. Forest Service International Programs are happy to be offering this webinar series. Uh, it's entitled Protected Areas for Everyone, and we're focused on protected area issues around the globe. Uh, the series already has included uh, a number of other sessions, six in the fall of 2020, focused on building resilience uh, for protected areas, particularly uh, due to the, the COVID uh, pandemic and what it's meant for conservation agencies around the world. This spring, we are continuing with six additional webinars, including three in English and three in Spanish between March and May. So the one today and one in Spanish on Thursday are the last in our spring series. In our March webinars in English and Spanish, we focused on leadership for equity, inclusion, and conservation. In April, we focused on barriers and support for women conservation leaders. Uh, if you were unable to watch those webinars or interested in seeing them, they are available on our website. And my colleagues uh, will be posting a link to that website uh, for all of you as well. In addition, everyone who signed up for the webinar today will later get a link to be able to watch the webinar afterwards or to share it with your colleagues. Our purpose for this webinar series is to continue to provide a virtual space for those in the global protected area community uh, to connect in these socially distanced times. In addition, we hope to use these conversations to help inspire us all so that our protected areas are more effectively and equitably managed and that our personnel and our partners continue to get the training they need and our protected areas better serve all people. It is our hope that this webinar series will contribute in a small but meaningful way to these big goals. It looks like we now have a number of people online. Uh, so thank you for being here and joining us. Uh, as you log in, once again, we ask you to use the chat function to say where you're listening in from. Uh, as we get started with our panelists, if you have questions for them, we would like to ask that you use the question and answer function at the bottom center of your pages, the Q&A uh, link uh, to uh, write any questions you might have. Ryan Fincham will be mo uh, monitoring that uh, Q&A session and we'll try to get a couple of questions to uh, our panelists at the end of the session this morning, which will only last uh, one hour. And that will be in the last 10 minutes of our hour together today. 
Uh, Aaron Hicks is providing technical support. If you have any issues with, uh, with uh, reception, please contact her through the chat. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about uh, how to broaden access to parks and protected areas. While racism and social injustice are issues deeply rooted in the United States and unfortunately in many other nations, protected areas and conservation organizations have an important role to play in promoting greater diversity and inclusion in their workforce while also expanding visitor access for all. And this should be regardless of uh, religion, race, ethnicity, national origin. It should be people of all ages and abilities. Uh, and they should come from not only from urban areas, but also from suburban and rural areas. And they should include individuals with distinct recreational preferences, income levels, and different means of transportation to truly be inclusive. So I'm now going to introduce our three panelists for today. Uh, Patricia Cameron uh, was raised in Maryland in the US East Coast, but moved to Colorado in 1994. She has devoted her energy to making Colorado, which is already a nationwide hub for the outdoor industry in the United States, a more equitable place for all. She studied philosophy at uh, the Colorado Springs campus of the University of Colorado, and also has a degree in emergency medical technology. Uh, she spent over a decade as an emergency medical technician or EMT, and then as practice manager of multiple clinics in Colorado. She has also served his, her community by working as a volunteer firefighter and in a hospital intensive care unit, and she is also a wilderness first responder. Patricia founded Black Packers in 2019 to address the gap in representation in the outdoors. A homeschooling mother of an amazing teenage boy, she struggled with the means and knowledge to be able to take her son on outdoor adventures. Patricia worked overtime as an emergency medical technician to buy her first backpacking gear, and then went alone on her first overnight backpacking trip in a snowstorm. She hopes to make it easier for families to access the outdoors by making the initial investment for them. She's a freelance writer and photographer, and her work has appeared in publications such as the Denver Post and the Colorado Sun. Patricia balances home life with serving as executive director of Black Packers. She is a 2020 fellow and on the board of the New Leaders Council, which is a nationwide nonprofit that trains and supports progressive millennial leaders and entrepreneurs. In the summer of 2020, Patricia successfully hiked the entire 486 mile at 777 kilometer Colorado Trail while writing a trail diary for Backpacker Magazine. Welcome Patricia. Our second speaker is Mike Passel. Mike is the Executive Director of American Trails. Mike has also served as the Executive Director of the Professional Trail Builders Association and is the owner and operator of a sea kayak outfitter called Alaka Expeditions. Mike has led groups of all backgrounds, ages, and abilities on sea kayak expeditions in the San Juan Islands of Washington and also to Vancouver Island in British Columbia and in Glacier Bay, Alaska. Mike worked with Wilderness Inquiry to conduct an extensive study of outdoor developed areas nationwide to determine the cost implication of constructing according to the proposed uh, Americans with Disability Standards. And he also worked on a congressional study on improving access to outdoor recreation activities on federal land. Mike has a Bachelor of Science in Recreation and Resource Management from the University of Wisconsin-Madison including three years of coursework in landscape architecture and civil engineering. Uh, Mike has presented on universal design and programming at several nationwide conferences, and he served on the board of directors of American Trails since 2000. His love of the outdoors and his own paraplegia have given him a great interest in the creation of an accessible outdoor environment that does not ruin the characteristics and value of the environment. Welcome, Mike. And finally, Janet Zeller, uh, she recently retired after 28 years with the U.S. Forest Service, where she served as the National Accessibility Program Manager. She and her team were responsible for the accessibility programs, facilities, and policies across the 193 million acres of the National Forest System and its 155 national forests and 20 national grasslands. Janet was the lead author of the Forest Service Outdoor Recreation and Trail Accessibility Guidelines. These guidelines were the basis for the federal accessibility standards for outdoor recreation areas. Janet serves 
as an instructor on accessibility and universal design of programs and facilities and on sustainable trails for all at a wide range of different training sessions nationally. She has also worked on accessibility issues with outfitters and guides, conservation groups, and other federal and state agencies, including with the US Access Board, the Federal Energy Commission, and the Department of Justice. Janet is a lifelong outdoor recreationist and a certified instructor trainer in canoeing and sea kayaking. As a quadriplegic herself, Janet understands how important it is to blend accessibility into outdoor recreation areas without changing the character or experience of the area so that people of all ages and abilities can recreate together. Now that we've introduced our three panelists, we're gonna to switch to the questions. And I'm going to begin with asking each of you just to provide uh, a brief uh, background on uh, things that I did not mention that you would like the audience to know. And maybe uh, uh, an interesting personal anecdote uh, to start off with today. We're gonna to begin with Patricia, who I understand just came back from the high country uh, and uh, uh, wilderness first responder training. Hi, Jim. I just want to thank y'all for having me, and I'm super honored to be here as a part of the panel today. You're correct. I just got back from Estes Park taking a 10-day Wilderness First Responder course. Um, that, of course, is for my own personal recreation, but also to make our Black Packers events safer. Uh, some of the neat things going on with Black Packers, uh, we just finished our season with the Rapaho Basin. And so for each event, we took about almost 30 people up to A Bay and paid for their gear, apparel, um, lift ticket, and a half day lesson. And moving on to the summer, we're partnering with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and we're going to be taking people to state parks to teach them how to camp and leave no trace, conservation, things like that. All of that is free of cost. And also, we have a program to teach Black families to swim because uh, Black kids are three times more likely to drown than their white counterparts. So we're going to do what we can to work on those statistics. And that's about is all that's going on with me and Black Packers at the moment. Thanks, Patricia. And yes, I recently saw how terrible uh, the, the global, another pandemic, the number of people that die drowning every year in the world is amazing. It's something that could be largely prevented just through basic education at an early age. So thank you for that. Uh, Mike, uh, let's turn to you now. What's happening up there in Bellingham, Washington, right on the Canadian line? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. And thank you all at the Center for Protected Area Management. It's really an honor to be a part of this panel. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I live in Bellingham, Washington, up in the great up left. Um, there's a lot going on in the trails. We're, we're, um, we're kind of inundated. I think you, you, you mentioned it, Jim, in this pandemic trails and outdoor recreation are seeing you know 200 400 percent in increases over use a year ago and it's just pretty astounding and it's causing a lot of uh, a lot of great things and a lot of not so great things on on the ground out there um, but american trails is is um, a trails advocacy organization that works on behalf of all trail user types so we include you know, motorized, non-motorized, equestrian, even water trails. And um, there's a couple of things we're doing right now that I, I think are really exciting to me, especially we're, we're working on developing trail training core competencies that cross the spectrum of all different trail user types. And we're, we're out of that creating a, a shared community of practice platform that, that everybody can get involved in. And, and used to make sure that trainings are consistent across across the spectrum. Um, the other thing that kind of comes out of that is we're developing a trail community map that that allows individuals and organizations to put put a dot on a map and say, "Hey, here we are. We're part of the trails community. These are the these are the things we do. These are what we're really good at." And then we can kind of facilitate the networking of, of people that we have never had contact with, you know, in different parts of the country or different, you know, economic backgrounds, social backgrounds, anything like that, we can start to understand um, where, where opportunities are to become better stewards of the trails system in our country. 
and we can find the trainings that we need or land managers can find the people that have the skills that they need to help manage their trails more effectively. So we're working with the Forest Service for, very specifically, but also professional trail builders on that and a whole spectrum of our partners as well. So that's just a couple of things that we're super excited about at the moment. And, Thanks, Mike. And as a member of America Trails, I've had the opportunity to go uh, to a number of your uh, of your international trail symposiums. And what, one of the things that I'm, most impresses me has always been the diversity of the groups present, uh, that it's a, a very, a very uh, broad tent organization that brings together people who uh, other times might be arguing over who gets access to a trail and using what technology, but they, they all, sh what they share is greater than the individual quibbles they might have about fighting over access to an individual trail. So let's now turn to Janet. Janet, uh, where, are you, uh, where are you and uh, what are you up to these days and how's retirement treat, uh, treating you? You're on mute. Helps if I unmute. I'm in New Hampshire, uh, Concord, New Hampshire. And uh, it's a beautiful country. We've got mountains, we've got ocean, we've got huge lakes. Um, we're not quite Colorado, which is my second favorite state. But uh, I'm loving retirement. Uh, I'm just going to fill you in a little bit. Um, you said in my introduction that I'm a lifelong outdoor recreationist. And I want you to know I grew up hiking and camping and paddling canoes. And I continued to recreate outdoors as an adult and with my own family. It was a real passion of mine. Um, then in the early 80s, I was injured in a fall on a flight of stairs at work. And as a result, a wheelchair became my means of mobility. Back in the 80s, if a person used a wheelchair, they were not expected to be interested in going anywhere where there weren't sidewalks. But I knew I had to get back to recreating in the outdoor world. And the first time I got back into wilderness, it, life just plain felt right again. So I know firsthand about the renewal that comes from recreating outdoors. And that's my ongoing motivation so that I, I want to do all that I can to blend accessibility into that outdoor world without changing the character and experience of the setting. So that people, of all people and people of all abilities can recreate together with, along with their, their family and friends. Now currently, um, even though I'm retired, I'm continuing to instruct uh, sustainable trails for all courses around the country with a friend of mine who, who, uh, who Mike knows, he's a professional trail builder. And um, I'm also serving on uh, several uh, other boards, uh, conservation-based uh, organizations, uh, because I feel so strongly about conservation in general. And thanks for this opportunity to serve on this panel. I think this is a great thing that you're doing, putting together these focused webinars and then maintaining them so folks can go back to them anytime. Kudos to the center. Thank you. And as always, we thank our partners from the U.S. Forest Service International Programs that also make uh, this series of webinars possible. So now I'd like to turn to specific questions to uh, each of you, beginning with uh, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, a lot of reports signal that participation rates in many different types of recreational activities, uh, including at protected areas, by people of color and by immigrants are lower than those in the United States, at least, for people who are native born and uh, Caucasian or white. Uh, as executive director of a group of black American outdoor enthusiasts, could you share your perspective on some of the barriers or reasons why people of color do not visit parks or do not participate with the same rates of participation as uh, other populations in society? And what parks and protected areas, what managers, I know a lot of the people online are park superintendents and public use managers, what can protected areas do to be more welcoming, to be more inclusive, to be more equitable, and to reach out to diverse audiences that are not visiting 
at least not in the same rates of participation as other people? Yeah, that's a multi-pronged question there, Jim. And first I'd like to acknowledge that I myself am coming to you from Colorado Springs, which is stolen land from the Ute people. So I wanna mention that before I get into our protected places and talking about who's native here and native born. Um, one thing I like to bring up that we saw in the outdoor industries report for this year, we're seeing those numbers come up. And so pandemic and otherwise, they have been steadily growing. So that's one positive note I like to bring up. When we talk about this country and the history of diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in outdoors, I think um, one thing we continually forget is about the issue of segregation in this country. And that did not just include, you know, Jim Crow South, and we're talking about, you know, bathrooms. We're talking about some of our national protected areas. We're talking about some of our um, national parks and national forests and the rangers and the people in those systems that upheld yeah. that segregation. And so years later, um, when it comes to maybe someone's familiarity with or comfort with those areas, I can speak to my own experience. Um, there's a little bit of concern there or maybe a historical aspect to the connotation of being on that land when it was explicit for many, many years that um, we weren't welcome. And if we were welcome, we were welcome in different ways um, that white Americans were welcome. And so that's one thing. And I think, um, a lot of that history we carry with us, even when we're not 100% um, aware of that um, through stories from our family, through history, through watching videos, through just the idea in this country of what recreating looks like. I like to talk about wealth in this country, and how wealth has been hoarded in this country um, and what that means to the classes we have and if we have a true middle class or what the sustainable wages and living wages mean. I know we talk a lot about wages in this country and I like to differentiate between a living wage and a sustainable wage. And there's a reason why. As a single mother, I certainly had a sustainable wage. I was able to pay the bills, feed myself and my son, keep my car running. But a living wage is a difference in was I able to enjoy outside activities? Was I able to recreate? Was I able to pay for my son and I to do something? And if I was, was it cheaper to go to a movie? Um, was it easier to access to then to the national forests or to the parks or the public lands? And did I have the knowledge to do so? So that's one of the things Black Packers focuses on. I like to say it's economic equity in outdoor recreation, and then meeting people at the intersection of economic vulnerability and underrepresentation. So I'm hoping to do two things here. One, give people a group of them that look like them so that you can possibly feel safer when you go out to those places. I myself living in Colorado and in Colorado Springs, um, the numbers of the diversity is not quite what it looked like where I came from in PG County, Maryland. So I can understand how it could be overwhelming and intimidating. I told the story before about how I took my son fishing at a park in a national forest and I watched the ranger drive around the entire lake and pass by many, many white families and only stop at me and my son to check our license. And so I can't say for certain what his motivations are, but of course, um, knowing the history of this country, being a black woman for 38 years in this country, I do know how I felt about what it looked like and felt like to me. So with Black Packers and groups, we like to do it together um, so people can feel safer and also change that narrative of what it looks like to be outdoors. And then secondly, returning to the wealth part um, and talking about sustainable and living wages and making the choice to recreate or how much it costs. In Colorado, we see it a lot more than a lot of places, just how much money the outdoor industry makes. I think it brings in like 2 billion here um, a year. It's something, a number like that. It's up there with like the things Colorado's known for like breweries and marijuana. So it's a huge part of our economy. And when that happens, of course, it becomes an issue of who can afford what um, and who can't afford these things. And in the history of wealth in this country, a statistic I like to bring up is since the civil rights movement, the median wealth of a black family has gone down by 75% and has gone up by 14% for a white family. And so that's how wealth is kind of created and held in this country. A lot of it is in home equity. And so when you look at that, I think the statistic is half of white homeowners can get their down payments for their family and 90% of black homeowners have to do it themselves for first time. And so if you know wealth is held in this country and home equity, you can see how that can be siphoned away 
through like redlining, things like that, racist practicing, um, how people value homes in the neighborhoods they're in. And so because of that, I like to talk about the intersection of not having a lot of diversity in the parks and the history of segregation and the history of treatment there, plus this intersection of people who have been um, systemically and systematically kept away from keeping wealth in this country. And so that's where I like to work on. Um, I think we are approaching the idea of diversity and inclusion by trying to be more inviting to everyone. I think that's you know great. That's a great first step. But we're missing the equity portion, and that includes um, who can afford these things and what does affording it look like and how are we leaving those people out? So Black Packers takes people outdoors and we pay for everything, um, all their gear, their transportation, to try to give them an intro into it and help them make decisions about the kind of gear they want to pay for, um, things of that nature. And I think lastly, I'd like to invite people who have positions or jobs or internships um, in these places. One, what kind of wages are you offering people? Um, not every family can or every person can afford to take a volunteer opportunity or an unpaid internship or these lower wages to get into the outdoors. So that might hold people out who might have some historical issues um, with wealth. And then secondly, what do your application requirements look like? Um, are you asking for experience that may look different for someone like me who was self-taught? I might not have a bunch of, or at the time have a bunch of the names or degrees or certifications that some people have, but what does my experience look like and how does that translate to what you're looking for on your application? Because it's just not enough to put that on a diverse job board, right? So those are the things I work with and I believe we can work on focusing more on the equity piece. And I always like to close by saying, I am in no way saying that all people of color and black people are poor. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is historically wealth has moved a certain way in this country that may make it harder for the people that you're looking for to get out there, to get outside. So, yeah. Thanks very much. And I think that thinking about those barriers to entry and barriers to participation is something we should all do daily, uh, both in regards to recreational access and then also in regards to the workforce. Uh, I think that your comment there that uh, not everyone can afford to be a volunteer has the time or the, or the money to be able to do so means that many, many of the traditional means of getting into the environmental field in the US and many other countries that involve being a volunteer, being an intern, they're basically off limits to many people uh, because of, uh, of, of lack of means. That's a really good point. So now I'd, I'd like to turn to uh, Mike. And, and Mike, American Trails is an organization with a very diverse constituency, which you have already said. Everyone from wilderness backpackers to rails to trails advocates working to convert old abandoned railroads into uh, multi-use uh, trails, and also trail runners, mountain bikers, canoeists, kayakers, uh, people who like to, to take their horses into the backcountry, off-highway vehicle enthusiasts. So uh, all, of, all of these groups are quite diverse, and, and they, but they all love parks and protected areas. They all want to recreate, uh, but sometimes they clash over access restrictions for their favorite form of access or their favorite form uh, of, of recreation. And uh, as was mentioned, some of those types of recreation require a lot of capital. Uh, to be able to do because they're, they're uh, equipment intensive uh, endeavors. So uh, for those in our audience that are dealing with these situations of, we have lots of people that want to use our, our trails, for example. And as you mentioned, trail use has skyrocketed, not only in the United States, but in many other areas, particularly where that access is free or low cost. What can we do to accommodate the widest range of users, of user groups, uh, and people with diverse backgrounds, diverse abilities, diverse interests uh, in, uh, in our cherished natural areas and our trail systems. And feel free to go in whatever direction you want with that. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a big question that, that pro probably takes a lot to answer, but I, I wanna give, I guess a couple of anecdotes. I've had a couple of epiphanies in my life, probably just two. The first of them was, back in my teens and had to do with girls and boys and is neither here nor there but but the one that I'm most interested in and that's most pertinent to this discussion is what I broke my back mountain biking in uh, 1991 and while I was laying in the hospital getting everything put back together um, 
I had an epiphany and that was, you know, the thing that I was doing while I was laying there, I wasn't worried, you know, that, you know, it never it didn't really occur to me that I, I wouldn't be able to walk again or that I'd have to go to the bathroom in a different way from now on. Um, what was really kind of getting me bummed or down was that I couldn't figure out how I was, I was going to go mountain biking again. And that caused an epiphany that that people really do, they they define themselves by their recreational activity. I certainly do. I'd grown up camping and hunting and fishing with my father and and canoeing and the whole ball of wax. And, and it was that that I thought about while, while things were being taken away from me. And that, so what I realized was that if you are dealing with people and you take away their ability to recreate, and if you think about recreation, it, it's recreation. You're recreating yourself every time you go out there. And I think we can all agree on, on that feeling. And that's why trail use and outdoor recreation has skyrocketed in um, the pandemic. People want that experience of recreating themselves. Um, and um, I guess what I, what I realize is that if you take away that ability for anybody, whether it's not giving them transportation access to what they want to do, or if it's a disabling condition, taking away something they love, or if it's a an, uh, policy change that takes away a traditional use of a, of a motorized vehicle in, in a certain land area, you know, people are going to have visceral reactions to that, to that being taken away from their their bodily ability to do something. And because of that, I think it's really critical that we think about that when we're, we're dealing with land issues or building of trails or especially um, taking away um, types of use on trails. Um, it, it's gonna create a very um, oversized reaction to people. So. Keeping that in mind, I think, is, is critical as you, as, as land managers and as, as uh, protected area managers, you know, if you, if you make those decisions, you need to be able to or be prepared to, you know, it's okay sometimes to say, you know what, this is, this is an area that we need to have very highly protected and, and therefore we need to stop taking motorized vehicles in that area because it's doing exactly this damage. But if you do that, you need to look at those people and say, well, okay, they're gonna, they're gonna rise up and just about chop our heads off for doing this. And rightly so, you know, it's something they've been doing on that land for a long time. Then I need to think about how I can create opportunities, equivalent opportunities in different locations that can still allow um, that use. And I have a little bit of a dream and I think people have told me it's Pollyannish and I think it probably is, but I envision a time when, when the Bellingham City Council is meeting and they're discussing um, a group has proposed, let's say a, a mountain bike group has proposed a new mountain bike trail and they want the city council to pay for it. And to sit, the mountain bike groups, of course, all come to the city council meeting and go, yeah, we want our trail. But my, my dream is that at what, uh, that a, a motorized constituent comes in and says, hey, you know, I'm a motorized trail user. I can't use this trail. I won't be able to use this trail, but I support it coming in because it is going to build our trail system and it's gonna provide great opportunities for users. And quite frankly, then those mountain bikers aren't gonna go on my trail and cause me a bunch of pain in the butt, you know? So it all comes around, it goes around, but, but by, by having diverse constituents invited to that meeting and, and supporting trail use, even though it doesn't benefit their own personal use, um, that can have a great, really positive effect on on the ability of us to create a system of trails that is reachable by all people. So we need more trails closer to urban areas. We need more trails in suburban areas like you wouldn't believe. Um, and then of course, rural areas, how do, how do people 
you know, that maybe don't have access to cars get to the trails that they need to really get that feeling of recreating themselves. So I encourage, um, you know, to the greatest degree possible, when you have these public meetings, invite, 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 invite people that you wouldn't think of that would be supporters of your, your cause. Um, and at the same time, you have to also then go to the meetings that, that, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily your personal perfect interest, but they support a greater trails community that serves all people. Um, so you have to go and you have to invite. Um, and I think that's my kind of my, I guess, dream. And I hope it, hope we can make it come true at some point. Thanks, Mike. And let's turn now to, to Janet. Uh, you have worked across the country, as you mentioned, uh, in capacity building events, providing advice to strengthen the capacity of conservation agencies and cooperating civil society groups to design, build, and maintain accessible trails and facilities so that everyone, including those with temporary or permanent mobility limitations, can enjoy nature. You say that you work to integrate accessibility into the outdoor recreation areas without changing the character and experience of those areas. Can you explain a bit more about that? Absolutely, Jim. Uh, I'm going to use U.S. Forest Service lands for my example on how accessibility can be integrated. Um, those lands cover 193 million acres across the U.S., and they provide the greatest diversity of outdoor recreation opportunities in the country. There are highly developed areas, for example, including more than 100,000 camping units, as well as picnic areas, swimming areas, and so forth. In those areas, there are constructed features, things built to make the visitor more comfortable. There are federal accessibility standards that apply to those constructed features. One example is the design for an eight foot standard picnic table. The Forest Service modified that design to meet the accessibility standards. That modified accessible picnic table looks just like the traditional eight foot Forest Service picnic table. However, those tweaks due to the accessibility requirements allow a person using a wheelchair to easily wheel up to either end of the table and eat, enjoy it along with their family and friends. And the Forest Service has more than 158,000 miles of those trails that Mike was talking about. And they're of all types. Uh, some, as he was just mentioning, are trails designed for motor vehicles, others for horses, and others only for people to hike. The trails accessibility standards apply to those new or altered hiking trails, and those standards require a firm and stable surface. Paving's not required. The slope of the trail can be up to 5% for short stretches with frequent short level areas seamlessly integrated into the trail. The trails still curve around trees and rocks, et cetera, and the result is the trail blends into that natural setting. And there's a plus. At the same time, one of the greatest enemies of trails is water. Trails constructed using the accessibility standards are also more sustainable because their design gets the water off the trail's tread. So it prevents water from eroding the surface. Trails constructed using the accessibility standards work for people of all abilities. The Forest Service also has millions of acres where there's no development, no constructed features. So none of those accessibility standards for constructed features apply there. In undeveloped areas, it's the laws and the policies that have to make it clear that all people have an equal opportunity to go to those areas. 
no one is to be denied and certainly also not denied just because they have a disability. Let me give you an example of that. There, the, some of the forest service land includes the 1 million acres of lakes and small islands in the Boundary Waters Canary Wilderness in Northern Minnesota. If a person wants to camp out there overnight, they're required to first get a permit because there are a limited number of those small islands where a person's tent will fit. So we have to limit the number of people out there at one time. As a person who uses a wheelchair, some permit administrators might look at me and think, I don't know if I should give her a permit. Maybe she won't be safe out there because of her disability. However, the law and the Forest Service policies make it clear, I have the same right to get one of those permits as anyone else does, if there are permits still available for the dates that I want to go out there and camp. So that's a, a quick sort of thumbnail look at how accessibility can be integrated into that full range of outdoor recreation areas without changing that character and experience of the areas. Thank you very much. And I now uh, like to ask each of you quickly, again, in the same order, to uh, mention a success story uh, that you have observed in your work or in your play and doing outdoor activities, uh, showing different steps toward improved equity, toward improved inclusion and accessibility, uh, where these are being taken by protected areas and protected area managers. Uh, and that basically help give you and all of us hope for the future that we're trying to little by little deal with these barriers and, and overcome them. So uh, how can we make uh, parks and protected areas more user friendly, to use a common, common term, uh, for all members of society? Let's begin with Patricia from your, from your own experience. Sure. Um, I think some of the, you know, just personally on my level, I've seen a lot of the partnerships <clears throat> off the local level um, improve and people reaching out um, and asking questions and wanting to partner with local organizations. Black Packers is one of them, but as you've seen, there's like Latino Outdoors, there's Days of Women's Wilderness, different um, organizations that have come together to create this kind of um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but the local agencies being more aware of them and reaching out, um, which I think is awesome, especially with like Colorado Parks and Wildlife partnering with different local organizations like Black Packers um, to take people out to state parks. I'm super stoked about that because what I've learned is if you take people out to state parks and they learned one state park, they have now learned all the state parks in Colorado and it just improves access um, exponentially. I think on a smaller level, if people are worried about things like wealth, when I talk about wealth, um, how to directly affect that. I think there's various forms of legislation that would improve that. I think improving wages, I think forgiving some student loan debt or ways to attack some of that wealth thing. So I think, you know, on a larger level, um, I love how organizations, like I said, CPW, have been reaching out to me and other local um, groups and nonprofits to kind of work on that. Um, I think it's important that when you're trying to um, improve diversity and, inc and inclusion and equity for any one particular group, that you look out there and see who's already doing the work and then put your resources behind that person instead of trying to step on other people. And so, you know, if you see, if you have an access issue with any variety of things, um, find the people doing the work. There are people doing the work, um, I promise. <laughs> there will already be out there. So I love how the local organizations and personally for me, Colorado Personal Life has been great with that. And you mentioned uh, Latino Outdoors and actually in our webinar in Spanish on Thursday, we're going to have the uh, executive director of Latino Outdoors uh, participate as well. Uh, so let's now turn to Mike. Yeah, when I thought about this question, the thing, the thing that came to mind was actually very recently. We we do a lot of advocacy on the, on federal programs for for trails, and one of the things that rose to our attention was the Transit to Trails Act which actually was just introduced. And that 
that coalition that kind of supports it was led by the Wilderness Society and a variety, kind of a, a whole variety of um, groups. But when we came in, um, it occurred to me, we kind of coordinate a, a coalition of, of groups that are um, uh, a little different, obviously. So they'll, they'll include the motorized community. And it occurred to me that there's really no reason that the motorized groups, for example, wouldn't support the, the Transit to Trails Act. It's it in most affects the economically disadvantaged and people with disabilities, and it serves those two constituencies very well by providing busing service to trailheads, essentially, uh, and parks and outdoor developed areas that they normally couldn't get to. So if you don't have a car, you're in, you know, obviously you're at a disadvantage for using these outdoor environments, like Patricia said. Um, if you can't get there, if you, if you don't have that transportation, it's really hard for you to participate. So this is federal funding to build that capacity. And so I, I reached out to our, you know, the people that weren't already on that coalition and, you know, they had some questions like the motorized groups had some questions like, where's the funding coming from? Is this going to take any funding from something that could be funding motorized trails? The answer was no. And therefore, they were, you know, quite happy to join in and join that constituency. And if you think about it, that really opens up a whole sector of our community that can support a, a program that, you know, typically or on face value was only being supported by kind of the wilderness advocates and the, and the uh, urban advocates. So it, it's, it really opened up that capacity. And I think we're seeing the results in that it it came to the floor and it's now being up for consideration. So I thought that was a really great example. Thanks, Mike. And I, I, I saw that you just testified before a, a congressional hearing uh, on these aspects just within the, the last week. And that's an important thing to remember to get the, the politicians, the decision makers on our side. Uh, and finally, let's turn to you, Janet. Well, I'm gonna go back to the Forest Service to use my example of success, because I know the Forest Service so well. So uh, according to the Forest Service in-person survey, each year more than 160 million people recreate on national forest lands from the highly developed areas right out to wilderness. In that same survey, we found that 7.8% of that 160 million people self-identified that at least one person in their group has a disability. That's close to 12 million people with disabilities currently recreating on the national forests and grasslands along with their family and friends. Uh, and 85% said the facilities they used, they found them to be accessible. And that's a pretty good success. Um, and that tells us that if we seamlessly blend accessibility into that outdoor recreation setting, people with disabilities will come and they'll recreate along with their family and friends. Great, wonderful comments from all of you. And I think one of the key things everyone mentioned is that we all need to think every day about what can we do individually and collectively to make protected areas and our trail systems more accessible. I think Mike's comment about the importance of breaking out from your narrow niche and creating those partnerships and larger constituencies that together have more political power and more chances to, to move the needle uh, is extremely important. Uh, oftentimes we retreat to our narrow user groups or people with only X disability or only X recreational interest. And we're not nearly as powerful as when we combine forces to work together toward common goals. So uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Fincham who's been monitoring the, the question and answer um, uh, a box. Uh, and I know that we have some good questions for uh, our panelists, Ryan. Great, thanks, Jim, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, a, a wonderful conversation, sparking lots of uh, good ideas and, and things that we need to uh, all be following up on. Um, the first question I have um, is for Patricia. Um, 
during the pandemic, um, you know, we've seen, as many of you have mentioned, you know, this this um, increased use of our public lands, um, and and different agencies have used different approaches to try to address that. So, you know, just as one example here in our backyard at Rocky Mountain National Park, um, they've moved to a reservation system, which you know adds additional barriers potentially for access. And I was just curious, you know, as we go down the road and we see more and more people recreating, using our, our, our public lands in our own backyards um, and additional barriers may be coming into play, reservation systems and other things. Um, I, I'm just curious, Patricia, from the audiences that you're primarily working with, do you view those as creating additional barriers for us getting more people of color out into protected areas? Um, and if so, what do the agencies need to be doing and thinking about to make sure that you know any new systems coming online are, are not creating barriers for for the audiences that are not visiting right now in the numbers that we need them to be yeah so i i was just up there so that was really relevant to what i was doing i i think that anytime you add anything new it could become a barrier for anyone um especially if the information isn't getting out there to the groups you would like it to get out there. Um, I think navigating an online system is kind of a, I think millennials and those around them would not necessarily have that trouble. I think the, the information would be our people being able to access like the, the idea that there is a new permit system. Um, for that matter, when I first got in the state parks, I just Googled it and that information was there. So I think, I think that part, um, is not necessarily um, a barrier per se, as long as the information is getting to groups. And that would be as simple as just sharing it with the different diverse groups. I do think that um, when we talk about having more people out there and going to reservation systems or even closing some trails, I think we should definitely, and this might be an aside, focus more on teaching people about Leave No Trace and conservation. Um, and Cause I think that would kind of mitigate some of those issues people are having with having higher populations out there. And I know that's been getting a lot of pushback too. The amount of people that's going out there might possibly be harming those areas. And I think definitely more conservation education will be helpful with that. But um, in terms of a barrier, I don't believe that the permit system itself is a barrier. I just think making sure people know there is a permit system and getting that information out there is important. Right, thank you. Um, the, the second question can go for Mike or Janet, or you can kind of bounce it back and forth as you see fit. Um, but there's a question about um, just what are some of the tools or techniques or suggestions that you may have for communicating effectively in convincing policymakers that investing time and resources into the management of our trails um, is important and actually can, you know, increase the return on investment or, or, you know, can bring additional benefits to conservation and the agency if we make that initial investment up front. So do you have any suggestions for people around the world that how, how they might um, approach their policymakers and, and, and work at convincing them on making the investment in trails? Well, I'll go ahead since Mike's still muted. But I want to jump on Mike's bandwagon, and that is you got to get out there and involve as many as you can. If you see an opportunity of some topic coming up that might be inter intersectional with what you are talking about, go uh, volunteer to testify to the city council or write letters to somebody. Uh, if you're putting together a board of any kind, get all those different representatives in the room because the more you can talk to other people the more you can they can understand what your position is you can understand what their position is and a better policy comes out in the end mike i stole your same program that you just <laughs> shared but it's a great one yeah i i, I just would completely echo that i think it's it's all about it's all about those invitations to participate and i think you know my what i've really realized in in speaking with a variety of folks recently especially kind of setting up some some coalitions to help the forest service manage their 10 year trail challenge for example um is that you know it's the invitations that matter um, if you if you don't invite the people, they can't come, and that's true of land managers um, seeking more diverse 
trail users or park users, um, you have to invite the people. You have to address their needs and you have to very explicitly say, we want you on our public lands. And that, to my knowledge, doesn't happen. And and I think to directly answer your question, I think, you know, the thing that policymakers re respond to is their constituents. So if you have a bunch of constituents saying the same thing, they will respond and they will do it what you're asking. Um, I'd, I'd like to just insert one more little thing. And that is there are subtle ways too of letting people know they're welcome. Um, and that is what pictures do you use? Uh, your pictures of all uh, white people, able body doing something, then a person of color, a person who has a disability is gonna feel like, well, we don't belong there. But if indeed there are some folks out who are of color and they're recreating or who have a disability and they're recreating, hopefully mixed together and of various ages, ask them if they would be willing to sign a release to have their picture taken so they could, you could show others that they are welcome here. And boy, a picture that has someone sort of like you in it says, oh, I must, it must be okay for me to go there. So sometimes it's very subtle. If someone's a little too shy about asking, they can get a message another way. And media, boy, web pages and such get Googled all the time. So it's a real good place to do some outreach in that way. I would like to add that if you're gonna, you know, use a picture of somebody out there, please play those people. Um, it, it, it's a lot to be on the internet, but also um, that's something that's valuable if you're talking about diversity in general of someone with a disability or a person of color. Um, don't just have them sign a release. Uh, also pay those folks. Um, that's uh, essentially kind of a labor or an emotional labor and a risk of them for them um, and a kind of public thing. So I always tell people, I don't work for free. I don't ask people to work for free, however that looks like. So that's my little two cents on that. Thank you all. And just one final question. So we're just a, a few minutes away from, from wrapping up. And so to end on a, on a, on not, not focus necessarily on the things that keep us up at night, because we could go on and on about that. And, and we need to tackle those issues too. But uh, to end on a bit of a positive note, um, you know, I'd love to know from, from each of you very quickly, you know, where are those, um, those, those rays of, of hope, you know, in, in the work that you're doing, what is it that makes you hopeful for the future in some way that we are making steps towards greater universal access uh, of our protected areas? And we can go in the same line, Patricia, Mike, and Janet, and that'll, that'll bring us to a close. I'm glad you didn't want to talk about what keeps me up at night because it's actually the last season of Game of Thrones. Um, I'm still having some insomnia issues with that, uh, <laughs> unrelated to Game of Thrones. I just like the fact that, uh, you know, in March, uh, the Outdoor Industry Association released that report, and it shows that, you know, the numbers of diversity is, is going up and first time users, um, pandemic wise, but also in general, we've been seeing those numbers trend up. So that makes me very happy. And just seeing so many different people out there on the trails and how they're using it because it doesn't always look like the person who's sending it, right? Like it's just the person who gently wants to walk or just see things or just sit. So I like how much I've seen of people who are exploring the outdoors, first time users and in their own ways. That's been making me super happy. Yeah, I kind of want to pile on with what Patricia just said. I think, you know, for the first time and for not a very great reason, you know, we're seeing the people that, that we feel like you know, we've been inviting to trails are showing up, you know, first time users are showing up at trails and that's causing issues, you know, because there's a lot, there isn't a, a general known understanding of how, how people need to act on trails. And so there's multi-user conflict that's happening and all of that, but, but the land managers, the really great thing that I think is awesome is the land managers are taking it not as a, oh my God, I can't believe all these people are here. Now my job is so much harder. They're like, yes, they're coming. And now I need to deal with all of the things that are coming out of this. And that's just gonna make our public land stronger in the future. Well, I'm gonna tag on on the end, sort of on both pieces. Uh, and that is, I think what, 
keeps giving me hope are the stories that I hear from people, an 89 year old friend who thought she was just going to see the view and ended up hiking the whole trail to the mountaintop because she thought it was just a gentle walk uh, and she couldn't believe she was on a mountaintop. Uh, another young family, a disability came into the family. The family stopped outdoor recreating. They found an accessible trail on a national forest and they're out there now almost every weekend. It's, it's a little stories like that that make you say, boy, it is working. That and the number of places that are still contacting me asking for more information on who does what and how to do what. Where can they find the resources? And I keep pointing them to our website. But, you know, it, there are, are so, there's so much more interest just in the outdoor world and people of all races, colors, uh, origins and abilities wanting to get out there and wanting to do it with their family and friends. It's all going up, I hope. Thanks to folks like Patricia too, making sure that we don't forget the things that we've got to remember and to work on. So thank you. Thanks Ryan for monitoring the question and answer session and to our panelists for your, your, your inspiring answers. Uh, thanks to Aaron uh, for backstopping us and logistical support. Thank you to the participants. Uh, I briefly looked at the chat and we have folks from North America, uh, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, Asia, Europe, and Africa on board today. So thank you all for your participation and your questions. Uh, uh, and we'd really like to thank all three of our panelists for their diverse perspectives. I think you've left us all inspired and motivated to keep working uh, to ensure equitable access to our protected areas. Uh, I think you all stress the fact that although we've had a lot of problems with the uh, pandemic, uh, a lot of the uh, problems that we've mentioned are problems of success, of more people, of more diverse users getting to our trail. So problems of success uh, cause managerial headaches, but those are the kind of problems we wanna have to deal with and not just problems of failure or lack of use and lack of support for, for our protected areas. We look forward to seeing all of you on future webinars. Uh, we hope that you're walking away from today inspired uh, to do more in your own ways to uh, make our protected areas more uh, accessible uh, for more diverse audiences. For our Spanish speaking uh, listeners, and I see we have a lot of folks from Latin America uh, today, remember that our next webinar is uh, on Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. That is three hours uh, later than this one. And uh, all of you that are listening in today are going to receive an evaluation form. We appreciate you filling in that brief form that helps us to improve our future webinars. Thanks again to uh, our team at CSU, to our panelists, and to all our collaborators at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs. We hope everyone has a great day. And please get out there and support your local parks and protected areas and use them and recreate and recreate, as Mike said, uh, in doing so. Thanks again, everyone. A real pleasure to see you all online this morning.